worthy is the lamb that was slain. It's where we ended, where we left off last week with the reminder that uh, we worship Jesus as Lord, but Revelation closes with the wonderful hymn that he's worthy because he was slain. I reminded us of the words from the Apostle Paul from Philippians 2 when God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave him the name above all names that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. God did that because Jesus humbled himself. Last week we started on this Lenten journey uh, looking at an unvarnished Jesus. Last week, focusing on uh, the fact that we follow not a Jesus who, who leads a charge to overcome his enemies by, by way of power, not a Jesus who seeks glory, but one who lays it down, a Jesus who came to serve. You know how the rest of the world does it, he said to his disciples, not so with you. A Jesus who gave himself up, opened himself up to be a great disappointment to his disciples. And so, on this second Sunday of Lent, we worship in wonder at the wonderful name of Jesus, but we do so in awe of Jesus' radical, self-denying humility and servanthood. This morning, I'd like to focus on the generosity of God in Jesus. By the way, um, one of our readings this week talked about the inclusion of children, where Jesus said, let the children come unto me. It reminded me that it's been quite a while since I've done a children's sermon. Oh, I so look forward to the day when we'll gather again, and I can call the children up front every week. But uh, I am going to do something uh, for the kids this morning. So if you've got your kids nearby and uh, can gather them around after the next song or two, I uh, just want to give you a heads up about that. First, uh, let's continue in worship. This very, very familiar old hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Morning after morning after morning, we see new mercies of God, a God who loves us, provides for us, and is oh so generous.
Hey kids, do you recognize where I am? Isn't it strange how long it's been since some of you, this is your Sunday school classroom. Others of you have gotten older and it, it used to be a Sunday school classroom for you maybe. But I just thought it would be fun to come down here in a, in a kid's room and just and think about you and pray for you. I miss you. Um, you know, Emma has been cleaning the church. And you know what she found when she was cleaning this week? She found this big jug of cookies that really, the sad thing is, is that these cookies should have been long gone uh, because over the last year, with us staying at home, no one's been able to eat them. But I thought I'd have a little fun with them with you for a minute. I hope you can hear me all right. I know I'm a little way um, from the microphone, but hopefully you can hear me. I'll try to talk clear. Um, but, you know, if we were having church normally and I had you come up front, I would do something fun like I'd have you come up and I'd say, well, you know, here's, here's a cookie for Caleb and here's one for Trafina, here's one for Bennett, here's one for Avery, here's one for Charles and here's one for James and here's one for Noah, here's one for Finian, here's one for Ari, here's one for Rosie, here's one for Kaya. Have I forgotten anybody here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I'm forgetting some people here. Lizzie, I got you there. Here's one for Levi. Uh, I shouldn't give one to Piper yet because she's not eating cookies yet. Um, but did I get everybody? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I think I think I got everybody. But then I would probably have fun with you, and I would do something like, let's give Avery two cookies, and let's give. Um, Charles three cookies. Let's give Ari four cookies. Um, we'll give Levi two cookies, and we'll give um, we'll give Caleb two cookies. We'll give now, we, and we'll give the rest of you just one cookie. And you know what would happen, right? I would. You guys wouldn't be happy at all. And you, some of you would be complaining and you'd be, maybe you'd, hopefully you wouldn't be grabbing for cookies, but you might be. And if we talked long enough about it, you would probably convince me that I should be a little bit more fair than that. And so I would try, my, by the end of it, I might agree and say, here, we'll give everybody three cookies, okay? But here's the deal that I wanted to share with you today. And that is, is that it's not just that God doesn't want to be unfair uh, to people. He wants to be more than fair. God wants to be generous. Not, not only God wants to be generous, God is generous. And God is generous to everybody. What, what if I was to say, I want to give more cookies to the, to the person who's the smartest? or the person who's the strongest, or the cutest, or the person that, which one of you do you think Pastor Jeff likes the most? And that's the one who will get the most cookies. You know what, that's not how God works. God not only is, is he doesn't do it according to how we can earn God, his love. God is generous. And he says, you know what, if I wanna give this, I might wanna give Avery this many cookies. And I might want to give Trophina this many cookies. And I want to give Lizzie this many cookies. And I want to, pretty, and God just loves to just keep pouring out his love so that there's more and more and more. And now, hopefully you know it's not about cookies. It probably wouldn't be good for, every, for us to just eat all these cookies, would it? But my cookies this morning are representing God's love for us. And he doesn't just say, oh, one for you, and two for you, and three for you. He just keeps pouring out his love, pouring it out for all of us more and more because he's so, because he's generous, but because he loves each one of you so much. I love you too, and I miss you, and I can't wait to get back together again sometime. Let me pray. God, would you bless my friends? I've been naming them, and I hope I don't forget anybody's names, but I do. I pray that you would bless Trefina and, and Charles and Bennett and Avery and Caleb and James and Noah and Ari and Kaya and Finian and Lizzie and Levi and um, I've already forgot, gone around the list again and forgot again, and Rosie. 
and I'll, I'll go back and circle back and Charles and Trophina and Caleb, uh, Bennett and Avery, did I get everybody? If I missed your name while I was praying right there, I apologize. You know that I, I remember you uh, at different times, but it's hard when you're listing off all those names. But God, would you bless each one of them and let them know how special they are and how much you love them and how much we all love them too. I pray in your name, amen. <laughs>
At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again, saw some more people standing around, and he asked them, why haven't you been working? And they replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. But they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching sun. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. The word of the Lord. three takeaways from my first week of reflecting on an unvarnished Jesus. Um, thinking about the false definitions we have of success and the avoidance of suffering. Remember, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, when Peter rebuked him for saying, no, no, suffering shouldn't have to be the way. Mentioned clinging to material wealth and possessions thinking about the sin of coveting. And then we ended the week with uh, James and John asking Jesus for special positions of power and glory and just acknowledge that that's an allure for all of us, wanting to make names for ourselves. This week, as I mentioned, I'd, I'd like to highlight God's generosity. So, so last week, Jesus' humility and not going uh, with the ways of the world. This week, 
the generosity of God that we see in Jesus. So much of our world is consumed by a scarcity mentality, that there's only so much to go around, so uh, we better grab what we can get. And the idea that uh, when somebody gets, somebody else is not getting. Contrast that with the biblical witness of a God who, who always provides. That's why I had us go once again to that verse from Lamentations, put to music in the old hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. On Tuesday, Zond included the funny little story about the temple tax, where, where Jesus provides the coin in a fish's mouth. And in fact, I wanted to just to read that little paragraph that he puts in there. I just found it kind of kind of fun reflection. He says, it's, it's how the temple tax is paid that makes the story so delightful. From a shekel coin found in a fish's mouth. But here's the reflection. People who followed Jesus always found that there was somehow more than enough. Water turned into wine. Loaves and fish multiplied. Money for a tax bill found in a fish's mouth. Jesus taught his disciples not to worry about provision. When we seek first the kingdom of God, what we need will be provided. Amen? But not only that God provides, but provides generously. Thursday, we read that uh, wonderful parable of the one forgiven of the huge debt. You remember that story? A man can't pay his debt. He, he gets thrown in prison, but that debt is forgiven only to turn around and withhold forgiveness of the small debt owed to him. A call to radical forgiveness. And I love this sentence in Zahn's book. If Christianity is about anything, it's about forgiveness. But I'd like to highlight yesterday's reading. And again, I acknowledge not everyone's reading the book, and you, and you don't need to, to follow along with uh, what I want to reflect on. Yesterday's reading was the parable of the workers in the vineyard. It's what I read earlier. Let me reread it and retell it uh, using the message, and, and I might even paraphrase the paraphrase here as we go on. Um, God's kingdom is like an estate manager. The vineyard owner, right? And he goes out, it just it tells us early in the morning. What, what time did he go out? He's, he's got to go out and find workers to work in the vineyard. As the story goes on, he's going to run into another group of people at nine o'clock, so it had to be before nine. So for illustrations purposes, I, I'm going to say he went out at six. It's quite early. I don't know who's getting to start that early. Um, in the message paraphrase, it says they agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. I don't know. I'm not sure why Eugene Peterson went with a dollar a day. I suppose it's because the original is a denarius, which is, which is a coin, a single coin. But it was a coin that um, equal to the amount of a, a, of a daily wage, a going rate for a day's work. So I suppose just like instead of a denarius, I mean, he didn't want to say a quarter. So he, he picked a dollar. But, but I got to thinking, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about the minimum wage and the, the, the talk about the establishing a, a $15 an hour minimum wage. Um, so let, let's go with that for a second here. And according to the story, I, I'm going to go with a 12-hour shift. It's a long day because he goes out early, but he comes to the end of the day, and we know that... A, a, it goes till six o'clock because the, the last group hired is at five o'clock. So I'm, I'm looking at a 12 hour shift. So doing the math here, 12 hours at $15 an hour is 180 bucks. So not just, a, not just a dollar. And I'm thinking that this guy in the story, which we do know then as we go along is obviously representing God, but the, the guy appears to be, I think he appears to be pretty generous. He seems like a nice guy and he's going out and giving people work. Uh, even at the beginning of the story, so so let's say let's say he's used to paying twenty dollars an hour, two hundred and forty dollars. 
So these people, these day laborers, he picks them up in the morning and they agree. Uh, the, the, the point is, regardless of what the wage is, a denarius, a dollar, $15 an hour, they agree to the offer and they head out to the vineyard to work. The story says that later at about nine o'clock, he sees uh, some other men hanging around, unemployed, gives them an offer. You go to work, I'll pay you a fair wage. Does it again at noon. The day's halfway gone now. Then at three o'clock, mid-afternoon, he's still hiring people. And then just to make the point of the story and to make, uh, the, to make it even more ludicrous sounding, at five o'clock, I mean, things are closing down. Things are shutting down. Some people have already left work early. Traffic is already starting to build up. But at five o'clock, he goes out and finds one last group of people that have not been hired during the day and says, go out, work in the vineyard, join the others. And now the day's over and the owner comes out, instructs the foreman to, to pay the workers. But start with the last group first, which would kind of make sense, kind of do the math, give them their 15 bucks, kind of make them feel bad if you kind of give the first ones first and they just kind of know they're going to get the, the last one and then maybe they're going to just have regret that they weren't hired earlier in the day. He pays the last group first. They come up and they each get their pay, $240 for an hour, one hour of work, $240. And when those who were, who were hired first see this, they now assume that they're, they're starting to do the math. $240 time. Somebody, somebody got their phone, got a calculator? Almost $2,000, right? I forgot to look it up. I think I did at one point earlier when I was preparing, but then I forgot to write it down. Somebody do the math there. $15 an hour times $240. Anyway, they assume they're getting a lot, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because they don't get that. They get the denarius. They get the dollar. They get the same amount that those who worked an hour. Each group, whether they started at 3 o'clock, noon, 9 in the morning, Everyone gets the same. And in the message paraphrase, it says that they groused angrily. <laughs> There's this initial kind of grumble, 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 and then they, they all pick a guy, you, you go talk to him. And it's, it's, it's clear their complaint. <laughs> Those last workers only worked an hour. An easy hour. It was like closing time. It was mostly cleanup. While well, we worked all day long, 12 hours in the scorching heat. And the reply comes back. I've not been unfair. I mean, obviously, that is the cry, right? This is so unfair. So unfair. But the owner says... I have not been unfair. I did not break my word. We agreed on a wage. You said you would do this. I mean, not only, not only it wasn't we, you agreed to do it for fifteen dollars an hour. I, I'm giving you twenty dollars an hour. We we had a wage set up. You got here's your money. You worked your full day. You got a full day's wage. A full day's wage. And then I, I highlighted these three lines from the message. I decided to give to the one who came last the same as you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Are you going to get stingy because I am generous? <laughs> Are you going to grouse? Are you going to be embittered? Are, are you and I going to cry foul when God is generous? As Zahn points out in this book, it, it's meant to be a crazy story. It, it offends our capitalistic sensibilities. It, it's not fair, not fair at all. And yet, Jesus says, this is exactly what God's 
kingdom is like. You know, two comments in particular, in particular stood out to me in the devotional book. First, that when you stop and think about it, it's only the vineyard owner who suffers any loss in the story. Right? There, there, there's this affront and offense that the workers who've been working all day are bringing up, but they, they didn't lose anything. They, they got everything that they were promised in the story. It's just that the ones at the end got a generous gift of mercy from the owner. But it's the owner. Look, look, what, look how much he paid out. What did he get in return for what he paid out? And if God is, in the, is, the, is the owner in the story, it, it, it cost God to be generous. It doesn't cost anyone else. Second, and I don't think I'd ever really thought of this before, but Zahn says, why, why is it that we tend to read ourselves into the story as the ones who've been working all day? And, and I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe you didn't do that. But I think the, the assumption is, is that we read the story, it's that we are the ones who are, are offended. We are the ones who have been... We've been here all along. I think for Jesus' original hearers, of course, you know, we, the, it was his own people, and especially the scribes and Pharisees, who are, who are hearing this story. And, and they are the ones who are kind of affronted by, by God's mercy. They've been serving God all along. But perhaps we should read ourselves into the story of, are, are we not the ones who have been so generously given? More often than not, are we not the ones who are like the ones who have really only come at the end, have worked for an hour? <laughs> And we have been given so much more than, than we earn or deserve, especially when we try to look through lenses of, of, of meritorious repayment. Zahn mentions the prodigal son parable on this, on this reflection day. And it is similar. The story of the, that son, the younger son who... Take, asks, asks his father for an early inheritance, and yet he goes and he squanders it all on loose living. He comes to his senses, and he comes back repentant. And his father is there waiting for him, runs out to meet him, throws a party, rejoicing that the son has returned home, but the older brother can't stand it. It's not fair. Like the workers in the parable of the vineyard owner. It's not fair. The elder brother's been obedient. He's been a good boy. He's not offended his father, scarred his reputation. And yet his younger brother gets royal treatment. It's not fair. It reminded me of the last chapter of Jonah, which often gets left out in telling the Jonah story, at least in kind of the Sunday school version. You know the Jonah story. It's, it's four chapters long. And Jonah is called to, to go and preach to Nineveh, to warn them of impending judgment. Jonah does not want to go to Nineveh and bring that message to the Ninevites. And so he tries to run away from God, gets on the ship, right? Heads down to Joppa, buys a one-way ticket to Tarshish. The storm comes, he gets thrown into the sea, he gets uh, swallowed up by the big fish. In the fish he prays, he's sorry, he, he tells God, I'll, I'll do it. He gets spit out onto the beach and he heads off to Nineveh. And you, in the typical Sunday school story is we get J Jonah, who was disobedient, repenting, turning around, going to Nineveh, obedient Jonah, does his job. The, the lesson is, boys and girls, do what God tells you to do. But that isn't the end of the story. Jonah does go to Nineveh, and Nineveh repents. 
Nineveh repents of their wickedness, and God does not bring calamity and judgment on them. And the fourth chapter of Jonah finds Jonah furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. And that's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew that you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. <laughs> I, I read that and I, I almost can't help but laugh. I, I, I think it's meant to be comedic. And yet it is so serious. Not, la not funny ha-ha but funny, the, the silliness is supposed to kind of slap us in the face. <laughs> Why would Jonah be furious? Jonah has a relationship with God. Jonah has come to his senses. God forgave him. God saved him from certain death in the sea. You would think that Jonah would rejoice in being a very successful preacher. He, he gives an altar call and the entire city is saved. But for whatever reason, and, the tell, and then this story comes to us, Jonah, Jonah just knows that once again, God wasn't going to give people what they deserve. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, as if that's a bad thing. And what I think is what is so silly and comedic in the story turns to sadness and tragedy when we hold up the mirror and realize that maybe we don't say those words. But more often than not, we are like the workers in the parable. Or it's, how come, how come other people get blessed by the generosity and the grace, the sheer grace and mercy of God? One of the classic definitions of grace is unmerited favor. It's a, I, I find it's a, it's, a, it's a fun little definition because of that word unmerited. <laughs> unmerited. You know, Santa Claus makes a list and he checks it twice and he finds out who's naughty or nice. But God's grace doesn't keep a list of who's naughty and nice. God's grace is meted out unmerited, unmeritoriously. It's based on nothing. God's grace is based on nothing but God's love and generosity. Nothing, nothing else. And so I invite you just to reflect on that this week, to be grateful, to cultivate a deep sense of gratitude for the grace that God has given you, the provision that God provides, and the grace that God lavishes. And then, to celebrate the wonder that God tosses out seeds of that grace to and fro, left and right, to all kinds of people. And to rejoice in that. To rejoice in the unending bounty of God's grace. Instead of hoarding it, thinking that there's only so much to go around and hoping that some undeserving people don't get it because we want it for ourselves. How easy it is to look around the world and just know, know that there are so many undeserving people out there that really deserve God's, at, at worst, <laughs> at best, disappointment, at, at worst, his, his judgment. But to be people of the kingdom that would celebrate the unfairness of the kingdom that God doesn't give to us as we deserve. But God gives out of 
his own generosity. Listen, listen to these lyrics here as, as Aaron is going to close us in this song about God's grace. It, it begins, it's there in the newborn cry <laughs> from the very beginning. And it's, it's there in the light of every sunrise. It's also there in the shadows of life. It's there up on the mountaintops. And it's there in the everyday and the mundane. It's there in the sorrow and the dancing. On the wedding day, as well as by the graveside. God's great grace. It's everywhere. And it's and it's there for the rich, it's there for the poor. It's there for the saint and for the sinner. And there is enough and more of God's good grace for the whole wide world. There's plenty of it. And there's more where there, that came from. Let's pray. Jesus, we're following you, you on this journey to Jerusalem. Would you continue to open our eyes to see the depth of your mercy and your grace? To be confronted with the radicalness of your grace, the generosity of your love. May we never cease, cease to be amazed at your grace. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving the whole world. God, those words are so familiar to us that they become almost commonplace, but, we, but may we never cease to be amazed that you love the world so much that you gave your only son. Jesus, show us again and again the wideness and depth of your mercy and may we be forever changed and may we be forever grateful and may we in in whatever measure you would deem right for us may we reflect that grace and love to those around us amen mm -hmm.